welcome to everyone here at the British Library and also to all of the many hundreds who are watching online um, around the world and also in public libraries all across the UK and as part of the Living Knowledge Network. Uh, tonight's event is one of the highlights of a programme which accompanies the British Library's exhibition, uh, which you've just seen the trailer for, Fantasy Realms of Imagination. Um, my name's Tanya Kirk and I was the lead curator for the exhibition, um, which is open until 25th of February, so you've got plenty of time to come and see it. Uh, the exhibition features rare items from all across the British Library's collections, including original manuscripts by Mervyn Peake, Angela Carter, the Brontes and Lewis Carroll, alongside loans from some of our greatest living writers of fantasy fiction, including uh, Neil Gaiman, who very kindly lent us his Coraline notebook for the exhibition. Um, we trace the roots of fantasy back to some of the oldest forms of storytelling, but we also celebrate the richness of the genre today. Um, we've got on display artworks, costumes, props, uh, clips from film and TV and video games, music and pop and fan culture all included in the exhibition. And we're absolutely delighted that Neil Gaiman is able to join us this evening. Um, our sincerest thanks go to him, not just for speaking here tonight, but also for his incredibly generous assistance with the exhibition. So um, he's also speaking tomorrow night at the celebration of Sir Terry Pratchett. He's also done an event for schools earlier today. Um, and he had a, a role on the advisory board for the exhibition, giving us advice all the way through the planning process. Um, he also wrote a lovely preface to our accompanying book, Realms of Imagination. Um, and Neil will be in conversation with Ros Caveney. Um, Ros was also on our advisory board for the exhibition, so um, great thanks to her as well. Uh, she's a poet and a novelist, perhaps best known for books on popular culture, including Reading the Vampire. Um, and her first translation of the poems of Catalyst and her Lambda winning novel, Tiny Pieces of Skull. And she recently published the final instalment of her fantasy series, Rhapsody of Blood. Uh, at the end of the conversation, there will be a chance to put questions to Neil and those watching online can uh, fill in the form which appears below the video window and we'll read out a selection of those as well. Uh, there will also be a bookstall in the foyer which you might have seen on your way in uh, at the end of tonight's event. Um, and I really hope that as many of you will come and see the exhibition as can. Um, we're really proud of it and um, it's, really, it's really exciting for people to be enjoying it after four years of planning. <laughs> uh, that's it from me. Anyway, um, please welcome to the stage our speakers for this evening. So, Neil. Hello, Ross. This is a conversation we've been having for a lot of years. It is. We've been talking about fantasy since about 1985. Yeah. Um, One of the things we ought to mention, because she died earlier this year, is that we were introduced by the wonderful activist, mystic, and novelist, Rachel Pollock. Um, you'd been at Milford? I'd been at Milford with Rachel, although I had met her at a convention a few days before the Milford, because I'd interviewed her for her book on Salvador Dali's terror. Right. For somebody or other. And, uh, and we'd met and liked each other, and then we were at Milford together. So. Well, when she came back to London from Milford, she said, I've met this young man called Neil. You and he will be friends. <laughs> I remember I got a phone call from you saying, hello, my name is Ros Caveney. Rachel says we're going to be friends. <laughs> I'm like, we, we, no, and my memory is that we bumped into each other at Forbidden Planet. And after a bit, I said, hang on, you're this Neil. Very probably, yes. And Mostly what I remember is incredibly long walks. Yeah, we used to... You, you were living out at... Uh, I was living in Sussex, and I was getting the, uh, the train normally to Gatwick Airport. I would leave my car at Gatwick, 
So I would have to get to Victoria where late night, every other train had stopped, but the Gatwick Airport train would run through the night. And, and I could pick up a night bus from Victoria back to Hackney. And we just walk the streets talking about this stuff. And, about, and the great thing about this is that it's a very good example of how real life gets turned into myth. In what way? In the fact that I would say that one of the reasons we need fantasy is fantasy is a way of making things that are more real than the real. And you take something like late night walks of two younger people talking about this stuff. Yep. And, and it becomes legendary. You know, the, well, it will be now. It will be now, <laughs> yeah. We will make it legendary. Exactly. We, I mean, it's like... I have a tendency to romanticise everything, as everyone always complains. Um, but that period of our lives when we were sitting in bars, in the Café Munchen, in the Mexican restaurant you, opposite. I, I remember you being, I, I mean, there is a level on which we used to make fun of you, particularly me, to your face, um, because you would say things like, one day, and you'd, you'd be pointing to the people in the Café Munchen at that time, and you'd say, one day people will look back on this era and they will not believe that Alan Moore and Ian Banks and Jeff Ryman and you and Dave McKean and Bill Sienkiewicz over there and Frank Miller were all here just drinking and talking. And I'm like, Rose, come on. <laughs> and you were right. Yeah, because I'm a poet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember... And I think the thing that fascinates me most about those conversations is we, for both of us, one of the things that was interesting is we both agreed on the role of a book by Hope Murley's called Lud yes. in the Mist and its place in fantasy literature. Um, and the fact that there were other works that we could, that there were themes that, occur really for the first time in Lud in the Mist. And, and you can see, I got to see uh, the, the hardback with its dust jacket um, for the first time today, which actually was really thrilling. I'd never seen the dust jacket until I saw it um, in the exhibition here. And the theme as expressed either by you or by me during one of those very late walks was the idea of a kind of fiction that seeks a reconciliation of the mundane and the miraculous. Yes, the, the, the recon, there are three great fantasy themes. There's the reconciliation of the mundane and fairy. There is the quest for the cure for the world's pain. And there's the education of the king or queen, or magistrate, or person. And I just remember talking to you about the idea of reconciliation and then finding that theme in books that I loved, books like Little Big by John Crowley, yeah. um, and having that as a sort of interesting place to hold on to when I was writing my own fiction, and I don't really feel like I've ever quite gone there. I tend to be much more in the the writing about change or death. Yeah. Um, one of them. <laughs> but I mean, Stardust. Okay, Stardust. Well, yeah, Stardust. <laughs> yeah, Stardust. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I've done it once. Um, um, kind of the graveyard book. Kind of, sort of. That's the education motif okay. as, as much as that motif because a lot of important fantasies chop and change those three things I'd say I, th I, I mean for me the idea of the idea of fantasy 
And the thing that gets me, I think, most excited about fantasy is the idea of being able to make a metaphor concrete. Yeah. Make a metaphor real and suddenly be able to do something like Neverwhere, where um, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said that Neverwhere changed them in that they were unable to walk past homeless people and pretend they didn't exist yeah. after reading Neverwhere because of the idea of people becoming invisible. And I'm like, yeah, that was, that's the metaphor, making it real. And they're like, okay, because after that, I had to make these people real. I had to look at them. I had to talk to them. Yeah. I'd give them money, but mostly I'd say hello. And it, it became a real thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that fantasy can do. Yeah, and there, there is a dark side to that, which is you can actually lose the person in the myth. I mean, in Peter Ackroyd's book about London, he talks about that woman who used to hang out in New Oxford Street and says, ah, oh, the spirit of St. Giles's Rookery lives. And you go, nah, nah. A whole load of us give her money when we come out of selling books in Forbidden Planet. <laughs> There's absolutely. Although I do love the, the way that people in London have become strangely mythic over the years. Um, there was Stanley, whatever his name was, who used to be the, the no sex. Uh, no protein. Yes, the no less lust through protein, through less protein. <laughs> man and um, oh, he was a sandwich and, man and he I walked around with a sandwich board he had his sandwich board he would occasionally stand and harangue and you would stand there and listen to him as he would explain to us his thoughts on lust and protein <laughs> and sitting there was less less lust through less protein and less sitting and he he walked around and and occasionally you just see him on the tube or on the bus carrying a sandwich board. And, and now he feels faintly legendary. His time came, yeah. his time went. And but I mean, Soho, Fitzrovia, that whole area is full of this stuff and always has been. And it's partly because it's an interface. Because stuff happens at the margins. And because fantasy is at the margins of the real, it can do stuff that, the re that realism can't. I'm, I'm never quite sure what the boundary is on fantasy. I get, I mean, I, mean, I love, the, on the one hand, I'm, I think it's so marvelous the British Library has a fantasy exhibition that makes me brings me absolute joy and on the other hand I I look at fantasy and for me I go well, where does fantasy start does it start when you invent a place does it start when you bend the rules but if you're creating people who haven't existed and you're putting them in places that don't exist even if it's a little English village that doesn't exist or a street that doesn't exist. Where, where is your fantasy happening? But it works when it's somehow specific. And whether it's specific because you put real people as real as you can make them in things that they never did and that never happened. Or just make your imaginary person so real in your head they feel like real. You know, that it's a matter of inhabiting those margins or and making the reader inhabit those margins. I think for me, the time that I've, I've sort of come closest to really blurring the lines on what kind of book you're reading was probably Ocean at the End of the Lane, mm -hmm. where it's, it's definitely not autobiography, it's not memoir, but it is. Yeah. Um, 
it's not fantasy, but it is. It kind of has a children's book hidden inside it. It's like if you read, if you read enough of it, suddenly there's this magical children's book that will open up for you and close again for you inside that book. But it also has adult pain. Yeah. I mean, the first thing of yours I ever read was uh, the short story version of Violent Cases. And there's a throughput from Violent Cases to Ocean. Mm -hmm. In terms of writing about family, because you've always written about so much about family. Uh, Sandman is about family. I mean, American Gods is about find fa found family because yeah. Shadow finds a sort of untrustworthy father in Wednesday. Uh, Graveyard Book is about family. Horrorline, oh God, is about family. <laughs> It's that lovely moment where you realize that you just say the same thing over and <laughs> over. And, um, but yeah, there's, I think there's absolutely a through line from Violent Cases. Violent Cases is almost autobiographical. I, I, when I explain it to people, I say that it's like a mosaic picture in which all of the red squares are true, but the red squares aren't actually the picture. But there's an incredible amount of truth in there. Um, Mr. Punch mm -hmm. is sort of the next one along in that sequence, in that, again, it's basically, um, even though a lot of the things in there didn't happen, just as many of them, and the unlikely ones especially, did, and that really is my family. I mean, there's, you know, there are conversations that I had while I was working on Mr. Punch that wound up verbatim in, in the book. I remember, so Mr. Punch, for those of you who haven't read it, is a graphic novel that sort of intersects Punch and Judy, um, the story of Mr. Punch, and um, my a sort of family history. And here is a kid who is sent to go and stay with his grandparents because um, his mother's having a baby and the kid has just had one of the regular childhood diseases. So even strange things happen to him. And I remember at the time I was obsessed with Punch and Judy, and obsessed with the peculiar ways that Punch and Judy seemed to echo through my family history. Mm -hmm. I, it had started uh, when I, you know, I, I started getting obsessed by, by Mr. Punch, Punch and Judy, and I said to my dad, you know, what, what you were, you were in South Sea. Um, what do you remember of Punch and Judy? And he's like, well, you know, you know, your, your grandfather had a Punch and Judy man in his arcade. I'm like, my dad was a gro my grandfather was a grocer. What, <laughs> he had an arcade? He's like, oh yeah, you know, Lud's Fort, um, they, or Lob's Fort maybe, it was, it was this arcade. He owned it for a few years and he had a, a mermaid in it. Uh, which was just a lady wearing a mermaid tail who'd swim around, and there was a Punch and Judy man, a few things, and it didn't really work. So, you know, I'm like, okay, this sounds like the thing that's in my story. And then um, I started asking more and more questions. My, my Uncle Monty, like Mr. Punch, was a hunchback. And uh, in... I, I adored him because he was the first adult I could look in the eye. It was great. <laughs> My Uncle Monty, he was a bookmaker. Was uh -huh. a and, um, and I remember thinking a lot about the baby 
in, in, in Punch and Judy, there's a baby that gets thrown out of a window right in the beginning and which and sort of starts off the story. Mr. Punch is left with the baby, but the baby cries. And he tries to sort of get it to stop crying by hitting it. Doesn't work. So then he throws it out of the window, and then his wife comes and complains, and he batters her to death, and then the policeman comes to arrest him, and he kills the police. You know, just happy little puppet stories that <laughs> entertain kids. Um, but I just remember this conversation at a family, some kind of family do, and suddenly I'm surrounded by these elderly aunts and elderly cousins, and I say to my Aunt Janet, I say, so, um, Monty, Uncle Monty, uh, why was he a hunchback? What happened? And she said, oh, he had tuberculosis when he had a ba was a baby. And another um, old elderly cousin who's listening to that says, Monty didn't have tuberculosis. He got thrown down the stairs when he was a baby. And another cousin who's listening to this says, no, 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 you're remembering it wrong. <laughs> Wasn't Monty got thrown down the stairs. It was, the, it was one of the twins who was thrown down the stairs, and he died. <laughs> and you're just going... I cannot make this up. I'm going to just put it straight in my book. No. And what I've heard is going straight in. And, but eventually you wind up with something that is, you hope is both biographical in the sense of it could not have been written if I was not me and did not remember being me as a kid and did not have my childhood and my life, but also it's imaginary. Um, because I'm going to play and I'm going to try and tell a story that isn't just this thing that happened to me. I want to tell a story that gets bigger and weirder yeah. than anything that could have happened to me. Another thing, apart from family, is text. It's you read, you know, books that you read when you were young that you want to make your version of, mm -hmm. you know, that Good Omens started off as William the Antichrist. It did. And uh, the Graveyard Book is incredibly intertextual with Kipling. It, it's sort of a conversation. The, the idea of the Graveyard Book was, um, I mean, the idea turned up first, but the train of thought that turned up with the idea, and so I, I was... Um, watching, I, we lived in a very, very tall house on which pretty much every room was um, stairs away from every other room. And I had a two-year-old son with a tricycle. <laughs> and I thought, I cannot let him ride the tricycle in the house, that way lies death. <laughs> so I would take him across the street, this little lane, that our, our house was next to every day. And he would cycle his little tricycle around the graveyard. And I just remember looking at him one day, mostly when people say, where did you get the idea for this book? You don't remember. Um, it sort of gets, you sort of remember bits. But that one, I remember the exact moment. I, I just looked at him and I thought, he's so happy in this graveyard. Uh, just tricycling around past all the gravestones. And I thought, you know, I could write a book about a kid who goes and lives in a graveyard and is raised in a graveyard by dead people and taught all the things that dead people know. And then I thought, that's an awful lot like the Jungle Book in which <laughs> Mowgli gets raised by animals and gets taught all the things that jungle animals know. And I thought, in which case, if that's the jungle book, this would be the graveyard book. <laughs> and from there, I went, oh, okay, then that gives me something to have a conversation with. Yeah. 
It's and like it's, a wall that you can bounce on. It's a very close conversation because um, the Gaul chapter is very much a conversation with the Bandalog chapter. Absolutely. And other bits of the conversation with some of the more obscure bits of the second Jungle Book. Yep. Um, so the point I want to make is it's not what makes the strength of it, it's the hard work. You, know, you, you have the idea and then you actually think about it. Well, with the Graveyard book, it was kind of hellish. I had to do a lot more than think about it in that. Um, the first thing I did when I had the idea, I was 25, and I had the idea, and I went away, and I wrote the first... I didn't go away. I went up to my room and wrote the first chapter. And then I read the first chapter, and I went... This is a lot better idea than I am a writer. I'm not good enough yet to do this thing that I've just come up with justice. One day I will be good enough. And so I put that first chapter away. Um, I actually found it. I thought it was like lost forever. And found it um, about a year or so ago. And read it and on the one hand it is terrible <laughs> um, which is fine that, I mean I was I was a 25 year old writer I was young I was not yet me but I was but there are some good bits in it but the bits that are wonderful and incredibly well observed and actually in some in their own little way are better than what I did in the graveyard book um, is the stuff where I'm writing about our hero as a two-year-old boy and what he's doing and thinking. Because I had a two-year-old boy in yeah. front of me and, I, and it was there and it was fresh. Uh, by the time I actually came to write the first chapter of the Graveyard book, you know, he was graduating from college. Um, so I had to remember much harder what it was like to have a, mm -hmm. a small boy with me. But what I would do is I would go back to that story in my head every 10 years, um, try and write a chunk of it, look at it, go, I'm not there yet. And then finally, after I wrote Anansi Boys, I thought, OK, I'm not getting any better anymore. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if I'm good enough to write it, um, because I think I'm as good as I'm probably ever going to get. So I have to write it now. And, and I did, I, but I cheated by starting in the middle this time, because every other time I tried to start with the first chapter mm -hmm. and, um, and it had defeated me. So I thought, I'm, I'll, I'll find the voice by starting in the middle. I'll write the witch's headstone, uh, which basically was, I think, my retelling of a story called, I think, The King's Ancus. Yes. Um, and finished that and felt very, very satisfied. It's like, okay, now I know who my characters are. I have a voice. This is a thing. It works. I'm incredibly happy. And then I went back and started um, about it. Eight months later, I tried writing the first chapter again. And I was just at the point where I'd written a page and a half and was ready to give up and decide that I couldn't do it. And my daughter Maddie came over and said, what are you writing? And I said, oh, it's this thing called the graveyard book that I've been trying to write for ages. She said, oh, well, read, read me what you've written. So I read her the first page and a half. And she said, oh, this is great. What happens next? And now I was doomed, because now I had. Right. <laughs> I was not allowed to go, oh, I am defeated again, because now she loved it, and I had to right. say what happened next. But it is that whole thing of, it's like the old joke about someone's lost in the middle of New York, and someone says, hey, newsboy, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And they say, practice, practice. <laughs> um, you've been an incredibly hard-working 
and disciplined writer for all the time I've known you, much more than some of us. Um, <laughs> I think I was, a, I was a determined writer. You were determined, I, I, and also you got yourself a gig where you had to produce something every month. Yep, that was important. I, I think I was a firm believer from the beginning in the idea of getting better uh, by doing what you were doing. And the idea, uh, the, the, you know, the... The Chuck Jones line of you've got a million lousy drawings in your pencil, so you have to get them out so the good ones can come out. I firmly believed that it was my job as a writer to write, to keep writing. Every now and then I'd write a lousy story, and what I could normally do is just sweep them under the table and nobody would see them or try and forget about them. Um, but it was okay. If I kept going, there would be good ones. Sandman, I, I mean, I remember being asked to write Sandman and being asked to write a monthly comic and sitting there going, okay, I have never had to write any, a story a month before. I know that if I try and come up with a scenario in which I have to tell basically a variant of the same story every month, I will leave this job after a year. I won't be able to do that. So I have to be able to come up with something that I can go anywhere with. Um, so I need a lead character who has existed all through space and time so I can do any story anywhere. And, um, and I don't think I can do superheroes. But there was a thing that Roger Zelazny did in his book Lord of Light where he had people taking on the aspects of the Hindu pantheon and of becoming Buddha and it's a science fiction novel set in a far planet a long way away. But it felt like, science, like comics. It felt like superheroes in a weird kind of way. Or it, it sort of made me excited and happy in the way that superheroes made me excited and happy when they worked. And I went, well, I can't do superheroes. I can't, I do not believe that anybody is right is more right than somebody else just because they can hit them through a wall <laughs> more than the other guy can hit them through a wall. I, my mind does not work like that. But I think I can do this thing with gods. And I think I can make that thing work. So taking those kind of ideas was really where Sandman began. And it allowed me whatever I happened to be interested in or obsessed by that week, as you knew, because you'd hear about it, um, would turn up in Sandman. And if I and, and all the things you never actually got round to writing. There were a lot of them too. My name is Isabel Gunn and I'm hard as nails. I remember. You never wrote her. She would have shown up in, yes. She, but uh, I mean, oh God, that line. It was there, was, there was more, and I remember her, but she never showed up in that story. Um, sometimes you wait for characters to come on stage, and they don't, <laughs> and it's incredibly frustrating. Um, I remember Barbie from the, the ga A Game of You. I kept expecting her to turn up again after the story. Everybody else in Sandman came back, and she never came back on stage again. I never knew why. Um, but I, I, I know I would never have written Wanda if I hadn't have known you and Rachel. And uh, Maz. Yes, but I didn't really know Maz well. Yeah, but you knew Maz enough. I, I, well, I knew Maz through your stories. So, yeah, you which is her. a good way of, and I met her, absolutely. <laughs> Terrifying. But I mean, there are things that are definite in Wanda that are definitely Maz and not me or Rachel. Oh, absolutely. And, and also, um, Wanda was a made up person. Yeah. Which is the, um, so I mean, you know, that's, that's 
the joy of writing fiction is you don't take your friends and put them down on the page. Um, you steal occasional things from your friends and go, I'm going to steal that thing, and I'll steal that thing, and I'll steal that thing from that other friend, um, and I'll use them, and then I will stir them together and add some sugar and put them in the oven for an hour and see what comes out, and it's somebody else completely new. But I, you know, I, I was talking this morning to some school kids about... Um, you know, one of the questions was, what are there things you would have done differently? Are there things you regret in your fiction? Are there things you would have changed? And I had to say, well, there are definitely things I would do differently. Um, but there's nothing I regret in the sense of writing Wonder. It was 1989, going into 1990. And I had trans friends, and there were no trans characters in mainstream comics. Or if there were, I had never run into them. And I was like, these are, you know, why aren't there people like Roz and Rachel in my comics? I will, I will create, I'll put a trans character in, and I will, and a lot of it also was things that you were telling me. You were telling me about, I remember how profoundly shocked and upset I was when you told me that there were people that you knew, women that you, trans women you knew, who had been buried as men and dead named on their tombstones. Yeah. And that I found so profoundly upsetting. It's like, okay, well that, that thing that is making me upset and angry, I want that to make other people upset and angry too. Yeah. And, and I want somehow to be able to reply to that. Yeah. Um, so all of that went in there. And, and over the years, people have come up to me and told me that reading about Wanda, Wanda was their first encounter with a trans character, Wanda changed things for them. Would I write Wanda now? I don't need to write Wanda now. There are so many fabulous trans writers out there writing. There are trans characters in comics everywhere, which is fabulous. And they're being written by trans people. I don't need to write them. Yeah. Um, but I'm so glad I did then. Yeah, but of course you'd, you'd read Tiny Pieces of Skull. Of I had. Else. Um, which actually is, I mean, Tiffany is in Tiny Pieces is... Much more like Wonder, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about... Sandman and story. There's that wonderful bit, which is actually in the television show, about the guy who was cursed with ideas. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's always impressed me about that story is that all of the ideas he's cursed with sound like good ideas. <laughs> that was the hard, it was the hardest bit of writing that story was going, okay, if this is going to work, I actually have to do the equivalent of sacrifice these things <laughs> for the greater good because people have to look at them and go, That's, that, I'd like that story. That sounds like a good one. That sounds like a, that could be a real story. That could. And that, um, and I love the fact that people every now and then do write the sonnet, uh, write the Sistina that I, that I, I, gave them with the key words, and that several times people have written to me and said, can I, can I write this idea from that sequence? And I always say yes. And I suspect that um, my story, How to Talk to Girls at Parties, was kind of one of, the, one of those stories, um, story ideas. I talk about... I just remember once, you know, I used to take a lot of trains. I used to travel a lot by train. Um, I just remember the strangest train that I was ever on in that it was one of those trains where you wind up walking down from one end to the other. It's 
one o'clock in the morning, you're on your way on, on one of those trains that will stop at Gatwick Airport and then go on to Brighton. Um, and the only other people apart from me on this train were incredibly beautiful women. And you'd have one, and they weren't like all together. It wasn't like there was a model convention or something. <laughs> Just one, you walk down, halfway down the train, there's another. They're all staring out the window. And it felt incredibly unreal. And I remember I putting that one, this sort of twilight train of beautiful women, into the list of ideas that um, he's cursed with, that Rick Maddock is cursed with. And that kind of, in a weird way, turned itself in 10 years later, 15 years later when I needed it, into how to girl, talk to girls at parties, where the, uh, you know, our protagonist goes to a party where all of the women are aliens. And because he is a 16-year-old boy, he is too stupid to realize this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And he, he keeps having conversations with them where they explain exactly what's going on to him. And he hasn't got a clue and basically walks out of the story none the wiser. Yeah, that's a good story. <laughs> um, the other thing is that you know what's what. I mean, I don't. you know... <laughs> So rubbish, Rose. No, no, no. You know when things work. I mostly. Yeah, I mean, you're one of the p best people to go to for advice about how to make something work. I mean, I remember that, that moment, which will live in infamy forever, and a thousand school kids in a hundred years will will moan about it when you said, "I think you should write sonnets." I was right. Yeah, you were, and. Uh, well, once at a time I was stuck on, on something and you said, I said, I think this is my way out of the hole I've written myself in. And you said, no, that's the thing that sounds like a really good idea but doesn't work and then you need to think of the second thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, that, You're good at advice. I'm, I am good at that. I, I used to think that, you know, if, if the whole writing thing fell through, I could sort of offer an advice shop for writers <laughs> where they could phone me up and say, my story isn't working, and I would say, have you tried doing this? Um, because I used to, I mean, that was how I started with Terry Pratchett. That was how Terry and I became friends. Um, we'd met, and we'd sort of hit it off at a few conventions. I, initially, I'd interviewed him for Space Voyager magazine. And we'd met at a convention or two. And Terry wound up just every week or two, my phone would ring. And a voice would say, hello, it's me, listen. What's, <laughs> what's funnier? <laughs> and he'd offer me two things. So he'd say, look, I'm stuck on this bit. And I've got this thing. But what if? And I listened to him, and, and normally what I wound up saying to him is, you know you can do both. And he'd say, how? And I'd say, well, if you can do this, then you could do, you can do both the gag where Carrot um, is the missing son of the king, and you can do him being raised by dwarfs, and you can have them both going on at the same time. It's, you don't just have to choose. And he'd go, oh. So, I, w I was fairly good at that kind of thing. You are. Which was, which was how come I, you know, uh, by the point that Terry said, do you want to co-write Good Omens? I knew that we could do it. And I knew that we could do it because we kind of, um, we'd co-plotted pyramids. That's the only book of Terry's that I ever would actually say, there's a lot of me in there. Um, and was amused some years ago when somebody did one of these, you know, computer things where it tries to figure out who wrote what in Good Omens and stuff. And they said, yeah, it, I've done this. But it's also showing you as having, show, you're showing up in pyramids. And I'm like, how unlikely. <laughs> um, but 
you know, we'd done the thing where we were doing the, we were co-plotting together. We were bouncing ideas around. Yeah. Well, I remember at one point, you and I and Alex Stewart and Mary Gentle mm -hmm. were doing some shared world anthologies for Penguin in the early 90s. And we took a load of proposals for shared worlds to them. And there was one they completely hated. So I made up said, a new one on the spot and they bought it. And we, and we together, yep. completely improvised an anthology. Yep. I said something, you said something, I said something. And before five minutes were up, we actually had a really good scenario that we hadn't had when they asked us. Nope. I, li I like doing that. It's, I mean, I could do it much more when I was younger. Now, now I like to think I can do it, but really I actually have to go away and think about things a lot more. But occasionally I can do that thing where you just sort of pull it out and you go, well, what about this? And they go, oh, that is the thing we have been hunting for. Yeah. And that was, that was fun. I, I, I remember learning because as a, a sort of a weird kind of knock-on of those Midnight Rose anthologies, um, I now write in fountain pen. Because when we did the Midnight Rose anthologies, people would send in stories, and they were good stories, and they tended to be about 3,000 words long, and they were really solid. And the next time I came to edit an anthology, it was about 1997. And when we'd done the Midnight Rose one, everyone was writing on computer. Uh, everyone was writing on typewriters. Now, 1997-ish, everyone is writing on computer. And all of the stories that were coming in were seven to 10,000 words long. And they all had as much story in them as those 3,000 word stories that we'd done, we'd found in, in the Midnight Rose days. And I just thought, it's like a gas. Mm. You're getting a thing where, because writing on a typewriter, you have to make a lot of decisions and it's kind of work. People are keep, were keeping everything concise. Um, on a computer, if you have a choice of doing two things, you can do both. Mm -hmm. And most people do, and it just expands. And I thought, right, I want, I don't want to be one of those gaseous authors, <laughs> as it were. I, I want to be, I'd like to be tight. I'd like to be constrained. And I went out and bought myself a fountain pen. Hmm. I just restrict myself to 500 words a night. That works too. <laughs> it does, and you get a lot written that way. Yeah, but also you don't, because you're only writing 500 words, they have to count. I can, yes. I mean, I, I know that I'm just capable of letting my words continue to expand and expand, and I don't want that to happen. Mm. Um, I I think I'm probably proudest of Ocean at the End of the Lane because it is 56,000 words long it's and it's a whole tight. novel and it's bigger on the inside. Yeah. We haven't got much time left before the question, so we need to talk very quickly about screenwriting. Okay, what would you like to know? Well, I mean, what's the difference? <laughs> How did you learn to screenwrite? Um, well, the best bit for me of screenwriting is the thing where you're screenwriting more of. Because screenwriting in a vacuum is kind of, it's interesting and it's fun, but it always feels to me a little bit like a kind of a technical exercise. You go, I'm writing this thing, but I don't know how it's gonna be performed really, how it's gonna be shot and all that. Good Omens season one was for me an exercise in adaptation. I'd taken something, mm -hmm and I wanted to turn it into something else. Good Omen season two, on the other hand, was just an absolute joy, because now I knew I have John Hamm, and I can get him to do this stuff, and he's gonna be walking naked through Soho at the beginning, <laughs> and everybody is going to think they're gonna hate him, 
and instead he's going to be this marvelous, goofy figure that they will all love, but kind of hate themselves for loving, but not know if he's bad, but they'll love him anyway. And over here, I will have my Crowley, and I know that I can get David Tennant to do anything now. There is nothing <laughs> that he will not go for, and so I can ask him to do things that are even more ridiculous. And then over here, I've got Michael Sheen, and everybody in the whole world just wants to, you know, it is, it is now forgotten by humanity that once upon a time, Michael Sheen was thought of as that actor who plays the really creepy people. Yeah. I saw him in Kingdom of Heaven the other night and thought, oh, that was Michael Sheen. That was Michael Sheen. He you know, the used, evil priest that gets killed. He used to play, I mean, he used to play creepy people. And everybody knew that if you want a good slimy serial killer person, you go for Michael Sheet. Currently, I got a phone call from him the other day, a little Marco Polo video message from him with the strangest haircut I've seen. And I get strange mess, you know, hair. Um, but this one, and he's playing Prince Andrew. So he's absolutely <laughs> capable of, of still bringing in the creep. Um, but... Um, you know, Michael, having just become this cuddly, cinnamon roll creature of pure love and joy, um, and knowing that everybody was just going to want to cuddle him for six episodes until I let him break their hearts. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Perhaps he will, not even the tiniest bit. <laughs> there is no sorrow in there. Um, when, when I, when I was in hospital when I saw Good Omens 2, and I t the moment I finished watching it, I, re I texted you and said, you magnificent bastard. <laughs> you know, I don't remember if it was you or John M. Ford, the late Mike Ford, who pointed out to me first that there is a thing that I do that I was not aware of doing. Um, and it was, and I remember this being pointed out to me at the time of the publication of American Gods, or possibly even before it was published when I sent it out in manuscript, because it was pointed out to me that one way that you can tell that you're entering the third act of a Neil Gaiman story is there is always a kiss that sort of ends the second act, and it's never a sort of romantic kiss. It's always a kiss that is unexpected and a little bit wrong, but it symbolizes where we're gonna go next. Yeah. Um, that was Mike, it's too smart for me. I, that was Mike, and I remember arguing with him and then him pointing out that I, all the places I'd done it. And then I did it again in the Nancy Boys and didn't realize that I'd done it. And then I, but I forget about this thing. And I saw somebody on Tumblr had found an interview with me from 2002 where I'm talking about this and the kiss. And they're like, still doing it then. <laughs> um, yeah. Mike's one of those great, great writers that no one knows enough about, who died too soon. He is John M. Ford, Mike Ford. His stuff is starting to come back into print and cannot overpraise it. I would recommend his novel, The Dragon Waiting, which is not a novel that you recommend to people who like dragons, <laughs> uh, because the dragon in question is Wales. Um, <laughs> but if you can imagine an alternate history version of Richard III with vampires, um, in a world in which Christianity never quite caught on, um, or at least is one of many hundreds of religions that were popular in the Roman Empire, um, you will love it. It's a fabulous book, and he was a, an astonishing writer. He wrote one of the best responses to 9-11 any of us have read. I mean, his death made me a poet. In what way? Well because I had given up poetry when I was young because uh, I wasn't very good. And I was so moved by Mike's death that I wrote a poem for 
my first time in years for uh, his memorial service. And people said, that's really good. And I said, is it? Oh. And so I started writing poetry again. And it was partly that tremendous feeling of guilt that I was here and he wasn't. And yeah. so we had a responsibility to do the things he couldn't do anymore. I mean, I've written several poems about Mike's legacy to me. Right? He was unique. Um, he was he, he's one of the reasons for sonnets, because he wrote a couple of really great sonnets. He explained to me how to write a Sistina. Yeah. Somewhere I still have the letter from Mike explaining how a Sistina is written and how the form works, which was what inspired me to try and They're write a bastards, Sistina. They're bastards, aren't they? They are awful. Anyway. <laughs> we should do questions. We should do questions. Uh, is there otherwise, we'll just be self-indulgent for the rest of the evening. <laughs> is there somebody with a microphone who is running around? or a peop there, there, that is somebody with a microphone. If any of you have wondered what somebody with a microphone looks like, it is that person <laughs> who will come to you. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Oh, uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Uh, Gaiman. It really is a pleasure and an honour. Um, and being so generous as well to, to stop and sign my sketchbook and pose for photograph. Apologies for that. Thank you very much. Um, I've tried to concentrate my questions, so apologies if this is a little lengthy. Um, my question concerns uh, the nature of truth, uh, particularly as it relates to mythology. Um, I've witnessed how important this concept is to you and to your own work. I thought that as subject matter, it is pervasive, uh, potentially fundamental um, to, to what it means to be a human being, uh, although possibly what, what it means to be a conscious entity beyond that. Um, the ancient Greeks had an expression known as aletheia, and viratas of Roman belief, um, as a deity, the personification of that which is evident, uh, factuality rea or reality, and antithetical to lethe, the spirit of forgetfulness of oblivion. Um, considering philosophy um, of truth as absurdity within the Nietzschean justice of will to power, and as discovery of the Heideggerian exploration of Aletheia as disclosure, um, seemingly mythos or myth has since become an analogy uh, synonymous with falsity and yet as didactical assumed a meaning amongst the ancients as truth itself. Um, authenticity, intelligible, um, epistemically knowable, uh, beyond the readily evident. When presented with the blue or red pill, seemingly people would rather choose what is true and accept the price of pain that it entails. What do you think one can learn from the idea of fantasy as being revelatory and the wisdom of mythos as truth? I think that people will choose uh, either the way of truth or the way of comforting lies. And, um, you know, I think we're living in a world right now in which people are kind of getting to choose their own truths and it's painful, it's messy, and um, it's not actually terribly good for the world because there are objective truths. Climate change is real, killing people is bad. Um, and the things that people sometimes wind up electing to believe um, can get things messy. On the other hand, I am a huge believer in the right to believe things however stupid, or however stupid they may seem to other people. And um, on the basis that I know wonderful people who believe things that I find strange, horrifying, or incredibly unlikely, and I suspect they would feel the same way about many of the things that I believe. Um, how these things fit into fantasy, I cannot say. Uh, sorry, thank you very much. I mean, if, if storytelling is a vehicle for information, then it's a high potency one. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's very good. Should I? Hi, I am fielding online questions. So I thought we'd just hop to one of the online questions. Um, and this is from Amber. And she says that the way you capture the genre of fantasy is truly unique. Why do you think you gravitate to fantasy writing compared to other genres? Um, I love 
a world in which nobody gets to tell me what to do. <laughs> um, I, as a kid, I thought I would grow up to be a science fiction writer. It was one of the things I had in common with Terry Pratchett, is Terry was a failed science fiction writer <laughs> who had never actually written any science fiction, really. <laughs> He just, in his heart, he knew he was a science fiction writer and somehow was failing by writing fantasy. I hoped that maybe I was a science fiction writer. Um, but I'm not sure why. Because the fiction that I loved was fantasy. The authors I responded to were fantasy authors. Um, the places in fiction that made me feel most alive were fantasy places. Um, I remember the joy of discovering at the age of about 11 or 12 the Pan Ballantyne adult fantasy series where they were reprinting all of these old books um, and discovering authors like James Branch Cabell and Lord Dunsany and all these people going, I, this, is, this is pure magic. This is brilliant. Um, so why... I should have assumed that I was going to be a science fiction writer. I don't know. I would read New Scientist every week, you know, virtuously, <laughs> going, I wonder if that's a story, and never finding any. Um, but I'd still read it. Uh, why do I write fantasy? I don't know, because I'm me. And those are the kind of stories I make up. A bunch of people there. Oh, thank you. Um, year, many years ago, I was watching the Neverwhere TV series on my little black and white TV, and I got the book uh, afterwards. Um, but ever since then, the kind of characters, there are so many characters in it that are really, really memorable. Did you ever have kind of either then or now kind of a favorite one within them? There's so many. <sighs> There are so many of those characters. I, the, so I have to, my, my dark admission about Neverwhere is I have a half-finished Neverwhere novel. Um, it probably isn't going to get finished until after Good Omens 3 has been written. Um, I thought about starting it again during the writer's strike and then thought, you know, it's just going to hurt me too much to get into this book, to bring it back to life, to start getting deep into it and then be told, no, you have to stop now. Um, but, so, and the truth is, my favorite characters in Neverwhere right now are the ones in there that you haven't met yet. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, there, there are ones that you, characters in there that you already know, like the Market of Carabas and, and Richard and stuff, but um, my, my favorites right now are the Seven Sisters, and they're awful, most of them. <laughs> um, Victoria lives, um, I don't know if anybody here remembers, there, there are, there are there are a few people ancient like what I am, so you may remember. Um, a long time ago on Victoria Station, there was a cartoon cinema. Does anyone here remember that? Okay, like three people going, yes. <laughs> it was on, um, on Victoria Station over near Platform 16. There was a tiny sort of art deco cinema it wasn't very big, and it showed cartoons and newsreels on roughly an hour loop on the basis that nobody's going to be waiting for a train for probably more than about an hour. And, um, and I went in it once or twice, mostly just stared at it as this strange thing. And so Victoria... And because time in Neverwhere is kind of strange, and because places in Neverwhere linger, uh, Victoria lives in that long-demolished cartoon cinema. Thank you. 
on Victoria Station. <coughs> Hi, this is 90% a question, 10% a plea to your writing consultancy job. Um, <laughs> um, do you ever, when you're writing, feel that your characters are getting away from you and, and sort of living a life on their own and they're doing things that you don't want them to do and, and that you, you're trying to sort of wrangle them back into the story? <laughs> yes and no. Um, I mean, a, a perfectly... If you're building your characters and you're building them with integrity, and you're building them to be complete people, you will occasionally wind up in places where you go, the plot is meant to do this, 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 and this, but the character that I have created will not do this, so what, what are they gonna do? Um, a, an example would be in Anansi Boys, when I remember getting about two-thirds of the way through Anansi Boys, maybe halfway through, and I had a plot, and I was very comfortable with my plot, and I knew what was going to happen, and it was all very fluffy. It was a, it was a fluffy sort of plot. It was very PG Woodhouse. And, um, and all of a sudden, I've got Maeve Livingston going up in this lift to go and confront... Graham Coates about financial irregularities. And I thought, hang on, if you, if you get into that office, he's going to kill you. I can't see any other thing that he's going to do. He will murder you. That's not part of my story. <laughs> that is not in my plot. And furthermore, this is a comedy. <laughs> and people do not murder each other in P.G. Woodhouse kind of books. They just don't. It's one of the things they don't do. It's how you know you're in a P.G. Woodhouse novel. You are going to live till the end, unless maybe you're somebody's aunt, you need a heart attack so that there can be a will or something. But basically, you are gonna, you're not going to get murdered. Um, and I remember just grinding to a halt. The novel writing process simply stopped, and I spent probably about eight, nine weeks thinking about my story, thinking, okay, I think I need to do right by these characters. I think this is what these characters that I've created would do. That being said, what, what does that do to my plot? What is my plot? Where is my plot gonna go? Where am I gonna take it? And, and what, and is this, am I now writing horror? Am I now writing a different genre? I thought I was writing a comedy. What makes this a comedy? And eventually I came to the conclusion that in horror, people get what is coming to them, whereas in comedy, people get what they need. Um, and I thought, okay, well then, I think I can allow that. If in this story, maybe a few characters do need to be dead, but does that necessarily... <laughs> stop them and what will that do and I let the book I let that happen and then plot it on from there because I trusted my characters let's go back to another internet one let's um we have one from um Emma and Emma says fantasy has such a rich literary history across the centuries but looking forward how do you see the genre evolving growing and shaping over the coming years or decades what I loved about going through the exhibition here, um, going through the, the fantasy exhibition, was feeling that it is exploding in all directions. Um, I remember when there wasn't any fantasy, really. There weren't... You didn't have a fantasy bookshelf in a bookshop. You didn't have a fantasy section. The fantasy shell novels were either shelved in the science fiction or they were shelved over in literature. Um, there wasn't enough. And there was a period where basically there was just Lord of the Rings. And then there was Lord of the Rings and knockoffs of Lord of the Rings, <laughs> which was kind of weird. And then there was Lord of the Rings, knockoffs of Lord of the Rings, books being published as trilogies 
that people hope you might think are like Lord of the Rings <laughs> and the Ballantine adult fantasy series. And then there were fantasy. Then, then now suddenly we've got a genre and there were publishers like Alan and Unwin who were actually going, we are going to publish good fantasy. And, and everything changed. And it felt like we were in a very new, very different world of publishing. What I love about what you get to see walking through the British Library Fantasy Exhibition is it goes in all directions. It includes what's happening in graphic novels. It includes what's happening in gaming. It includes what's happening in video gaming. Um, it includes television in weird ways. You, you go into you know, the, the Black Lodge of Twin Peaks and it's, I don't know whose idea that was, but I want them to be given a large bar of chocolate. Um, <laughs> So, I, and it's all my way of saying, I have no idea where fantasy is going. I don't think it's any of our jobs to see where fantasy is going. Our job as creators is just to explode. Um, and other people can find out where the bits land and the damage that we do. Um, we just have to explode and, and be make things that feel true and maybe beautiful and hope that other people are doing the same. I would love the idea that 100 years from now, the British Library Fantasy Exhibition would be filled with stuff that none of us could imagine. And that would be amazing. Um, just a very slightly self-interested question. Many, yes, Mr. Many Lake. years ago, I met Ros Caveney in the first science fiction and comic book shop. Dark they were in Golden Eyed when she was a customer. In the 80s, I used to meet Neil Gaiman wandering around Forbidden Planet. You also sold me books in Dark they were in Golden Eyed, but I was like 15, so you don't remember <laughs> that. I was in school <laughs> uniform. Is it the bookshops still exist instead of us all simply communicating and buying from online? Would you like to give a little shout out to the bookshop? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, I would, Mike. And, um, you know, I think it's impossible, just a, a big extrapolation. It is impossible to imagine the world that we're in right now without the likes of the bookshops of the past, without Dark They Were in Golden Eyed, um, first in Berwick Street, then in, is it Queen Anne's Court or St. Anne's Court? St. Anne's Court. St. Anne's Court. Yep. And um, it would be impossible <laughs> to imagine the nexus of literature that Ros was talking about, uh, you know, the reason why all of those people were hanging out in the Café Munchen was we were doing signings and events in and around Forbidden Planet. Um, and also, we'd started hanging out there because it was easier to hang out there because we knew that the other ones would be around. So it, it you know, a there was a golden age um, that actually got created by Forbidden Planet mm. at that time um, that kind of ended once Forbidden Planet moved into New Oxford Street. Um, <laughs> I wish everybody here could watch. watch. Now, also I am be we're being mine. I'm being mine. Um, but I think that, you know, the fact there is a, an importance to physical places where you can go. There is an importance to having informed people behind the counter who can tell you what's coming out and what's good. Um, there are so many books that I have read that were incredibly important to me that without the likes of, of 
Dick Jude or Gamma or whoever was hanging around Forbidden Planet telling me, you need to read this, it's really good. Um, I, you know, I remember being basically being ordered to buy Neuromancer <laughs> by them the week it was out as an ace, whatever it was. And so I bought it, this new ace paperback, Neuromancer, and never looked back. Um, Bookshops and the people who run bookshops are an invaluable resource and the likes of uh, the Amazons and the online places. You may get books from them, but you will not get soul, you will not get spirit, you will never get the magic. And they don't have that nice smell. <laughs> I mean, seriously, there were points in those shops where I'd pick up a book <coughs> and I'd read a few pages from fairly on and also it would smell nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember picking up Tim Powers' The Drawing of the Dark and it smelt right and, I, you know, and there was a sword fight on page three and it, <laughs> I knew this was good stuff and this was the real thing <laughs> in a way that you wouldn't just reading it on a screen. The smell, I mean, I, there's part of it that's almost, a, it's on the one hand kind of funny that you can talk about the smell of books. And on the other hand, I remember the smell of Michael de Larabetti's Borrible books. Whatever the paper that they were printed on had those extra vanillins or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> oh, yes, I am buying you. You have an interesting smell. Yeah. And, yeah, it's true. It's true. Okay. That got weird fast. Let's do something. <laughs> um, seeing as we live in an age now where there is so much poetry, both contemporary and historical, it's what do you think makes a truly unique poem? Putting the quality aside, you know, because everything's about love and war, and what makes it unique? I'm going to give that one to Ros to kick off with. Ooh, all the poems. Crumbs. That's a toughie. Because it's voice. I mean, you know, you know, it's it's the poem. It's the poem that only that writer could write, and no one else could write. It's that sense. I mean, one of the reasons I stopped writing poetry for years was that I was at Oxford with a bunch of people who were really pretty good. I was sharing a flat with one with a couple of them, and. I just went, oh, God, they're much better than me. And the answer was I was trying to write their poems, not mine. Um, you can only write your own poems. And you, you know, there is no... There are nine and ninety ways of constructing eight tribal lays, and every single one of them is right, is what, as Mr Kipling said, who knew a thing or two. You know, you just... I think you put your finger on it and it's yeah. there and it's right and it feels right, it smells right. Um, I think also in poetry, as with everything else, you have to be willing to write the lousy ones. Yeah, God. You have to, and you can't just sit there waiting to write the perfect poem. You have to write the poem that isn't very good, but maybe has a line that you'll rescue later. Um, or maybe just needed to be written in order to write a decent one. I, I don't think of myself as a poet. I think of myself as a writer who has written a lot of things. And some of those things have been poems and some of those poems have, whether by accident, luck or design, been fairly decent poems and have gone on to have a lifespan. Um, are remembered, get read, and all of that kind of thing. But, and I'm proudest right now of one called uh, What You Need to Be Warm, because I wrote it to order. Um, I was requested by UNHCR, the United Nations Ref High Commission for Refugees, um, to write a poem or do something with the idea of warmth. We wanted to do something that would um, basically motivate people to donate 
money for refugees because it was getting cold. We were heading into winter. And we had a lot of refugees who were going to be very cold, and we didn't have the money. Um, so I, as an attention and fundraising thing, went onto Twitter. It's a thing that we used to have in the olden days that was good. <laughs> um, and I said, what, you know, ask people what they remembered about warmth. What, what, what sums up warmth to you? and read over a 1,000 replies and went, OK, that's a theme, and that's a theme, and a few people have pointed out that, and tried to construct a poem using things that people said and then tried to take it somewhere. And at the time it came out, uh, we had it woven into an incredibly long scarf, and then a year or so later we made it into a short film um, and a couple of years ago, we decided to make it into a book, and I gave the rights to the poem to UNHCR. So it is the only book I'm incredibly proud and happy never to make a penny from. Um, any money that would have gone to me or to the artists, and there were over there were 13 artists, um, some of whom were refugees. Um, and it's beautifully illustrated, and it's about belonging, and home, and warmth, and childhood. And I love that every copy that gets sold makes you know one pound forty nine for refugees, and I just think that's a good thing. So that's the one I'm proudest of right now. It's quite hard to follow that. So, someone. Hi. Um, it's been nice to hear your thoughts about the art of writing and fantasy, but I'm curious um, whether you could share any of your thoughts about the state of the industry or the profession of writing right now and how it's changed in the time that you've been doing it as a job. I, when I started, I understood the profession of writing. And I understood the pitfalls, and I understood how you got published, and I understood how it all worked. Um, I'd say up to about 10, 15 years ago, I still understood it all and understood how it all worked. And right now, I feel like the entire industry, not the art form, but the industry of writing is in a state of flux. Um, a lot of the gatekeepers and a lot of the barriers have gone. A lot of the ways that people made money have gone. A lot of the things that used to work no longer work. A lot of the ways people found each other don't work. Some of them have been replaced by things that worked for a while. Um, I think we're at the end of social media. And I'm not sure what that is going to do, because I think for there was a period when social media, particularly Twitter, allowed people to find each other, allowed people to communicate with each other, allowed groups to happen. Um, and I think that thing is feels like it's coming to um, an end. And I'm not sure what's going to replace it. Um, I don't know how long the economics of traditional publishing are going to work. I don't know how the economics of self-publishing and, and the ways that you can self-publish are actually going to work in the future. I'm just standing here going, I think, we're in a state of flux. I think that, you know, maybe five years from now, we will all be able to go, okay, so this is how you get published. This is how it works. These are, these are your outlets. These are your places. This is how you get an audience. But right now, I don't know. And I consider myself privileged, fortunate, lucky, um, 
and even faintly guilty, to have been writing at a time when the rules were fairly clear. You could, you could write short stories, and if you wrote short stories and people liked the short stories, and an editor liked your short stories, maybe they'd trust you to write a novel, and if the novel did okay, then you'd get a contract for more novels. Maybe you'd get a contract for three books, and you could do that. And over in this corner, we're doing comics, and these are the rules for doing comics and how you could get a comics gig and stuff. I don't feel like any of that stuff makes... The, the rules have kind of finished, and I don't know what the new rules are. And I wish I could give you an answer that was more helpful or optimistic. Um, but at least, I, but, I, but I also have no doubt that we're in a world in which people love stories and people, bless their hearts, will pay for stories. Um, even if we're reduced to being in the marketplace telling stories and stopping at an exciting bit until they throw us um, <laughs> sandwiches or, or <laughs> fountain pens or whatever we need. Um, and then start again. If I can stick in, uh, I read manuscripts for a living. What I will say is that the proportion of, blow me, that's really good, to, oh, for God's sake, <laughs> um, remains pretty constant. <laughs> I mean, and the take this back and do it again better is getting better. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I, I am the death of hope, but <laughs> uh, I mean, God knows I've had tr enough pro problems publishing my own books, but ha ha ha, I am. <laughs> I am, I am the death of hope for, many, for so many people. <laughs> and yet, there are still good books. And the trouble is that there are some people who think they know, and there is no no. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've sat on panels with people who said, oh, well, I, I, I'm a total professional. This is how I write a book. You go, yes, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of... Back in about 2000, end of 2000, I was in Chicago and I had an event and Jean, Jean Wolfe, the wonderful writer, I uh, cannot overpraise Jean Wolfe to any of you. Um, and Jean Wolfe, one of my favorite novelists and short story writers is sitting in the audience and at the, in the intermission, I, I go over to him and I say, Jean, I've just finished the first draft of this book, American Gods, and uh, I think I figured out how to write a novel. <laughs> and he looked at me with infinite pity. <laughs> and he said, Neil, you never figure out how to write a novel. You just figure out how to write the novel you're on. Yes, I think it's somewhere in that wonderful book, Pictures from an Institution by Randall Jarrell where someone says, a novel is an extended piece of fiction with something wrong with it. <laughs> I've written some of those. <laughs> and with that... Yeah. I think that's that. That's a wrap.